Episode 1 of Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell Adapted for radio by Mike Walker With Joseph Milson as Eric Blair It was the summer of 1936. I was married. I'd just written The Road to Wigan Pier. My ideas were beginning to crystallise as the political situation in Spain began to descend into chaos. I thought that at last I might have a part to play in the struggle of world socialism to create a society where, for once... The working class were in the driving seat. (coughs) There any coffee? Creo que quedaron en el cazo, camarada. In the pot? Pot. Uh, Pot. Uh, Yes, si. Thanks, comrade. Uh, Gracias. Oh! (laughs) <laughs> Calentito, oh. a que sí? It's bloody hot. It's good. I needed that. Cigarette, comrade? Oh, gracias, camarada. Uh, thank you. Yeah. They say it's Russian tobacco. A tobacco <coughs> russo. <coughs> oh. Voy a matar a esos malditos gallos y desayunármelos. <laughs> Kill the rooster. <laughs> El galo. Los dos. Uno, bang, dos. Bang. <laughs> very, very good. I, I shot an elephant once. Ne- never shot a rooster. Um, prefer to shoot at fascists. Uh, no puedo comer fachas. You choke on a fascist, but a good chicken, eh? Oh, 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 even a bad one. It is food. And a hungry man never turns away food. Can you see it? Justo en el punto de mira de mi... Putas balas saboteadoras. Another dud. That, that's the trouble. Nothing works here. Hoy han ganado los gallos, pero mañana... Yeah, that's it, comrade. Today the chickens won. Tomorrow we'll kill back. Um, I was hit, uh, shot by a fascist sniper. It was on the Wesker Front. I was part of the uh, 29th Division of the People's Army. I was a lieutenant. It was the 20th of May, 1937, uh, five o'clock in the morning, near the corner of the parapet. I felt it it was like um, somehow being at the centre of an explosion. Yes, uh, there was was a bang, incredibly loud, and a flash of light, no... um, (coughs) no, no pain at first, just this vast... Shock, as if I'd shriveled into nothing and everything around me had um, shrunk or or gone away, far away. All of this, these these feelings, they must have taken less than a second because because then my knees gave way. Mierda! Mierda! Uno ha caído aquí! Ha caído un hombre! Is he hit? Are you hit? Where are you hit? Hay sangre. Sangre por aquí. Le han dado de seguro. Comrade, can you hear me? We we need to open his shirt. Cut his shirt. Can you hear me, Eric? We have to get at the wound. Tienes una navaja? Where's that bloody knife? Toma, usa esta. Necesitamos vendas. Vendas! Necesitamos una camilla! I always said he was too bloody tall. Bloody hell. Bloody fascist bastard. No puede hablar. 
Debe ser la garganta. Debe tenerlo en la garganta. Look, get him on here. Get him on the stretcher here. Okay. You ready? Oh. <coughs> Careful, comrades. Throat wound, Calvary. He's already uh, dead. <coughs> Easy. Come on. Let's get moving. Más vendas. Necesitamos más vendas. It will be all right, Eric. It will be all right. We'll get you to hospital. It will be all right. Yeah. Okay. Together. Lift. <coughs> Where's that bloody van? Bloody anarchists, they never bloody... Just do your job, comrade. And keep your mouth shut. They're going for an ambulance and it's coming. Put him down here. Look. Easy, easy. Come on, go and see where the van is. Quickly. Voy a ver dónde está. God. You're a fag, anyone? You are. Oh, Taylor made. Jammy bastard. <coughs> Thanks, Conrad. Got for Barcelona. Eric's missus. Uh, They're coming, mate. We'll get you to the hospital. We'll be all right. He's coming. He's here. At last. Camarada. Buena suerte. You hang on, comrade. You'll come through this. Um, the day I got shot, it wasn't quite the last act of the whole tragedy, I suppose, if I'm being honest. And I, I want to be honest, that's what it was. But it was certainly the beginning of the last act. <coughs> As for the start, that, that was the year before, uh, December 1936, when I arrived in Spain. I remember, um, I remember being in the Lenin barracks in Barcelona. Uh, I saw a young volunteer, 25 or 6, reddish hair, tough looking. He had a peaked leather cap uh, pulled down over one, one eye. He was gazing at a map that one of the officers had open on a table, and there was, there was something about his face, the face of a man who would commit murder and throw away his life for a friend. As we left, he stepped across the room and gripped my hand very hard. Odd, the affection you can feel for a stranger. It was as if his spirit and mine had crossed the gulf of language and... Uh, tradition, and we met in utter intimacy. I hope he liked me as well as I liked him. See, I, I knew somehow with absolute certainty that I would never see him again. <laughs> you see, for me, at the beginning, that young man was what it was all about. Now, looking back, that's not really the beginning, of course. No, that was during the summer of 36 in England. We, Eileen and I, were discussing the news. Uh, the news was all of Spain. Uh, the papers, the radio, and, of course, the cinema newsreels. Spain's Republican government faces national unrest as it fails to reform a way of life that has changed little since the Middle Ages. A wave of strikes by the anarchist-backed Trades Union Congress brings in a new Popular Front ministry, with anarchist and communist deputies holding the balance of power. On the 18th of July, a young general in exile in the Canary Islands arrives secretly by plane in Madrid. His name is Francisco Franco. In the streets, State radio plays through loudspeakers. Españoles, sintonizad la radio. People of Spain, stay tuned in. Traitors to the Popular Front government are circulating lies and spreading panic. Do not panic. Stay tuned in. Only state radio will tell you the truth. Keep listening. Do not panic. Que no cunda el pánico. Panic spreads rapidly. 
Sunday the 19th of July, the radio broadcasts Españoles. People of Spain, a small group of traitorous generals have raised a rebellion against the lawful government. There is nothing to fear. There is everything to fear. Civil war has begun. In Germany, Chancellor Adolf Hitler promises to stay out of the conflict. Meanwhile, the crack German Condor squadron is sent to provide humanitarian aid. In Great Britain, Mr. Baldwin, though sympathetic to the cause of General Franco, counsels caution and advocates a policy of non-intervention by all European nations. Birds, custard powder. I seem to remember we were talking about custard powder. Eric was asking me why we had so much custard powder and I said it was because he had ordered it and hadn't ordered the gobstoppers. It was midsummer 1936. We were recently married. Eric had a garden. We were growing our own vegetables and... To be honest, I wasn't very happy with the cottage where we were living. The oven, the gas oven. I had to clean that thing just to make it work. It was terrible. It was prehistoric. We'd opened a small general store in the village of Wallington to help make ends meet until... Um, until, well, I had a book with Galance, uh, The Road to Wigan Pier. We hoped that Galance would publish it through the Left Book Club, which would guarantee a sale of 40,000 copies. And then there was war in Spain. Civil war. It was a revolt against the elected Republican government by the fascists, the, the church and the army and the capitalists. They didn't care about democracy. Yes, it, it was right-wing revolt. Now, I, I think you, you had to know how people felt then. People on the left, this, the, the terrific feeling that had arisen, the, the hatred and fear of fascism. Tom Galloway. <clears throat> I was a miner, a trades union member. And like a lot of the brothers, I was concerned about events in Spain. There were thousands of us. Ordinary people, working class men and women, who wanted to fight. To take part in this struggle, despite the... British government's lack of support for the Republican government, the legally elected Republican government. For most of these volunteers, it was the Communist Party of Great Britain that provided the means, that became the natural uh, conduit for the journey to Spain. I went to the headquarters of the Communist Party at King Street to see the General Secretary, Harry Pollitt. Please sit down, Mr. Blair. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Pollitt. Uh, should, should I call you comrade? Are you a member of the party? Uh, no, but you knew that. Then there you are. Huh. How may I help you? Well, <coughs> I, I wish to go to Spain and record the struggle of the Republican government and the people against the nationalist rebellion. Now, I've been told it will be difficult, if not impossible, to cross the border into Republican-held territory without accreditation from a, a trusted organisation. And the British Communist Party is, in the eyes of the Spanish government, such an organisation. That is true. And as I'm sure you are aware, Mr Blair, many party members are already in Spain, part of the United Front struggle against fascism. However... That does not quite explain to me the nature of your request, since you are not, as we have established, a member of the party. I am a socialist. You cannot doubt that, Mr Pollitt. However, I must ask myself, what kind of socialist are you, Mr Blair? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not certain the question has any relevance at this, at this time. The general line is always and everywhere highly relevant. Quad ubique, quad semper, quad ab omnibus est. Look, 
Surely the, um, surely the point is, Mr. Pollitt, we all share a desire, a passion, to fight fascism wherever it appears in the world. And yet, Mr. Blair, it is important to know that you can depend upon your comrades in the fight. In a struggle of this nature, party discipline is vital, and that depends on political reliability, and I cannot find it in myself, Mr. Blair, to believe that you are politically reliable. I hope I am not. But that makes no difference to my support for the Republican government. I wonder if, in the end, it is even wise that you should go to Spain. <coughs> it is dangerous. The anarchists, our supposed allies, are daily committing the most appalling atrocities. If you find yourself in anarchist ranks, how long do you think you'll survive? If I was you, I would think hard about this whole plan of yours. Perhaps your pen would be better employed at home. I am determined to go, with or without the help of the British Communist Party. You're a stubborn man, and I admire that. Here's what I can do. If you guarantee to join the international brigades and accept party discipline, we will issue you documents of accreditation. In principle, I would have no objection to joining the international brigades. I intend to do so, but I cannot guarantee in advance to do so. I must see with my own eyes what the conditions are, what is happening out there, and only then, only when I know what is going on, do you see? I see, Mr Blair, that we have no more to discuss today. Thank you for your time, Mr Pollitt. We met afterwards at the pub. It wasn't good news. Obviously, Harry Pollitt didn't consider him politically reliable. Not that Eric was exactly annoyed by this. In a way, I think he sort of expected it. And anyway, it was quite true. Eric had never been, never was, politically reliable. Not if it meant sticking to a position, however much the evidence of his own eyes might point to a different conclusion. He never felt bound to a party line. In fact... I've always felt that whenever he saw a line, he felt on a bound to cross it. Harry Pollitt was the classic apparatchik, a survivor, a very tough customer, a man who could execute a 180-degree turn whilst maintaining that he is heading straight ahead at all times. He knew exactly what he wanted. Or perhaps what the common turn and Stalin wanted. It's important to remember that. The common turn was financing most European communist parties straight out of Moscow. And their party policies were likewise coming straight out of Moscow. We know that now, to our cost. We didn't know then. If we had, I, at least, might not have been so keen to see Eric go to Spain. But then, well, we both felt it was vital in view of the international situation. I thought there would be something distasteful, disgusting even, in talking about socialism and what was right and decent for men and women in this world if one hadn't put one's own life on the line. It would be like... Uh, like playing poker with someone else's money. Like the stock exchange, I suppose. And I never wanted to be a stockbroker. I just wanted to get to Spain any way I could. Uh, Fenner Brockway, MP for the ILP, the Independent Labour Party. To be honest, by 1936, the ILP was no longer the force it had once been in British politics. With the war in Spain, we, we saw a chance to exercise greater influence on the left using our links with Poom, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> we set about getting British volunteers to the war zone, particularly those who were beginning to make a name and reputation on the left. Hello? ILP offices, how may I help you? I'm trying to contact Mr. Fenner Brockway, MP, regarding travelling to Spain. And your name, please? Yes, it, it's Blair, Eric Blair. Ah, Mr. Blair. 
pleasure to meet you, even over the telephone. I am an admirer of your work as George Orwell. I look forward to the publication of your book on poverty in the North. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brockway, I presume? Yes. You mentioned Spain. What can we do for you, Mr. Blair? Well, I heard that the ILP had an office in Barcelona. That is correct. Yes. Would it be possible to provide me with a letter of introduction to your representative there? John McNair. Yes, a good comrade. A dependable man. We could certainly do that for you. Oh, and, and it would aid my travelling if there were any way in which I could be accredited as a member of the English press. If you would like to contribute articles on the struggle to our magazine, New Leader, you could be issued with a press card. Well, uh, that would be splendid. You're not actually a member of the ILP. No, not, not at this time. Hmm. Well, that can be attended to later. We will write to McNair and send you a press card. Um, if you will be so good as to give me your address... So I had my press pass and my papers. What I did not have was money. The Galans had just confirmed that the Left Book Club would take the road to Wigan Pier. They were offering an advance of £100 for the publication, which was good money. Galance wasn't paying up yet. Partly, I think, uh, because he was concerned about sections of Wigan Pier and was adding a preface to the book stating that my opinions were not his or those of the Left Book Club or, or the Left in general, which left me with a problem. He'd been to see the bank manager to try and raise an overdraft. For a holiday in Spain, Mr Blair. Hardly the proper subject for an overdraft request. Eric explained it was a war, not a holiday. Oh, I was in the last show. I should keep out of it if I were you. And the bank certainly can't be doing with such things. I told Eric we just had to sell the family silver. I said, do we have any family silver? Eileen reminded me about my parents' cutlery set. They'd given it to us on our marriage. She was always very uh, practical, much more so than I ever was. If we pawned it, it would raise enough to cover things until Galantz paid up. I agreed that Spain mattered a lot more than a load of old knives and forks. I said we could tell his parents we'd sent them away to be engraved with the family crest. <laughs> and Eric asked, do we have a family crest? So off he went to Paris to get his visa. And while he was there, he called in on Henry Miller. Um, I was living in Paris at that time and Blair was passing through. He'd reviewed Tropic of Cancer and been highly complimentary, and we struck up a correspondence. I don't know if we were friends, but I liked him. I really did. I had an argument with the taxi driver on the way here. I'd made a mistake. The journey was only a couple of hundred yards, and there was no profit for him, and he was angry. He shouted at me, and I shouted back. Do you think you're too old for me to smash your face in? I actually, I, I bellowed at him. I surprised myself somewhat. <laughs> That's Paris, Blair. Hmm? She does that to you, and you know what? Paris doesn't give a damn because she's what she's always been. The bitch you love and the love you hate. And she has you by the balls, and she knows it too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn, I almost forgot the kettle. I almost let it boil. The enemy of good coffee. I used to live on coffee when I was in Paris. Ah, coffee and love. Uh, coffee and no love, actually. No love is free. Uh, nothing in this world is free. In this world's the only world there is. There go. Uh, that makes you one hell of a miserable bastard, Blair. Maybe, yes. And now you're going to Spain. I was in Burma, you know. I was a policeman. I saw... I did discreditable things in the name of an empire I no longer believe in. Yeah, now you never stop beating yourself up about it. There is such a thing as guilt, as being responsible, and you can't shrug that off. At least I can't. Payback. <laughs> Fascism isn't going away. Italy and Germany are both deeply involved in Spain. They see it as a rehearsal for the next war, the big one. 
That's the way human beings are. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Fascists, communists. <laughs> Is there a difference? Here. Thank you. It's hot. Be careful. Don't want to burn yourself before General Franco gets his chance. But nothing's going to change if we don't try to do something to change it. Well, I still think you're dumb to go to Spain. I couldn't look myself in the mirror if I didn't. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's good, Miller. You make a decent cup of coffee. Hmm. Now, there's a thing to have done in this world. Eh? But all your shooting and politics, is that going to change anything in the long run? In the long run, we're all dead. It's today and tomorrow that matter. Do we need another revolution? <laughs> what would you fight for? Ah, now, there you have it. Hmm? What I love. And what do you love, Miller? Mm. Damn, this is good. Cycling. Cycling? Mm. I cycled everywhere as a kid. Miles and miles and miles. I had three bikes. Mm -hmm. The best I bought from a German at Madison Square Gardens. Made in Bohemia. <laughs> Took everything I had. But she was a beauty. Ah, I used to talk to her as we flew along. <laughs> It was a perfect moment and a perfect time. If you could only put your Spaniards on a bike, then you might change history. Mm. You're not really a cyclist, are you, Blair? It sounds exhilarating, Miller, but no. I've ridden a horse, but... Uh... You're still going to get your ass blown off in Spain? I've been looking for a cause I could honestly shoot a rifle in support of all my life. And I, I think this is it. I ain't gonna say don't go. Every man has a right to go to hell or Spain <laughs> in his own way. By train for you, I guess. Yes, I leave tonight. Well, I don't have any advice, but I do have a damn fine jacket. Corduroy. Double lined, thick and warm. Here, take it. You'll need it if it gets cold down there. And it will get cold but, down there. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure when I'll be able to return it. Mm, you don't need to. Just stay warm, and if you can, stay safe. Only I have this feeling you won't do that. No, sir, you won't. <laughs> now, don't let this fine coffee go to waste. On the train going south through France, as we passed the little stations, there were French workers waving giving the anti-fascist salute. I felt... I felt that for the first time here was a movement, something bigger than borders, bigger than any country, something as big as the human heart, an urge to freedom and uh, decency. I, I travelled with a shoe salesman. I... I tried to get a pair of good-sized twelve boots from him, but he only had he only had samples. He did tell me not to wear a suit once I arrived. It was the uniform of the oppressor. So I put on Henry Miller's jacket and Eric Blair. Hmm? Yes, John McNair from the ILP office. Ah, they told me you were coming. Told me to look out for you. Well, you're not hard to find in a crowd of Spaniards. Welcome to Barcelona. Welcome to free Spain. Well, thank you, uh, comrade. It's good to be here. Sewers and oranges. It's the smell of freedom. Do you have luggage? Only what I'm carrying. Ah, you know that much then. Yeah, I learned it in Burma. Travel light, never carry anything you aren't prepared to lose, including your illusions. Actually, John Watson says it in a Sherlock Holmes story. Ah. What do you want to do first? A uh, cup of tea? You've come to Spain, not Stepney. We'll get a coffee. Barcelona struck me more forcibly than, than I think any other city I'd ever visited. Simply, it was the first time I'd ever been in a town where the working class were in the saddle. <laughs> Almost every building had huge red or black anarchist flags draped over it. 
Every wall had revolutionary symbols painted over it and over each other, and every shop and cafe told you it had been collectivised, and no one said sir, and everyone said comrade. It was exhilarating. Well, I wasn't exactly impressed with Eric Blair. I was told that someone would be arriving from the ILP in London, and I should meet him, show him around... I didn't like his manner. Didn't like his accent. I didn't like the idea that he should get special treatment. I mean, who's this ex-public schoolboy lording it around Barcelona? And it didn't help that he was so tall and looked down on everyone. Take a seat. Thank you. No need to shove your bag under the table. It won't get stolen here. Uh, Camarada, cuando puedas... Salud, camarada. Uh, ¿Qué tal? Ah, uh, good. ¿Quién es el pie grandes? English. Come to write about the struggle. English too, huh? <laughs> Me, I speak good English. Happy to make your acquaintance, comrade. Uh, and you, comrade. You have come to see the free city of Barcelona. Here is the true revolution of the proletariat. I want to write about the war as well. No, no, you do not understand, comrade. We here in Catalonia do not make war. We make revolution. We fight for land. We fight for the control of the... um, ...medios de producción. The means of production. Uh, For us, war is revolution. This you must understand, or you understand nothing. It's true, Magner. It's true, comrade. For a man to fight for no reason makes him an animal. But to fight for the people, for the land, for workers, this is a grand thing. Now, I'll bring you good coffee. Coffee of free men. Very, uh, it's a very interesting waiter. There are no waiters, only comrades. Goodness, no waiters. How does anyone get their coffee? Look, Blair, this isn't an adventure. This is serious. I understand that perfectly well. Do you? I think you might find the issues are rather more complex here than they seemed back in England. The issues are simple enough, surely. A fascist rebellion against an elected government must be defeated. It is time for men and women to stand up for freedom and, if necessary, lay down their lives for it, too. I'm sorry, my my, my wife tells me that when I get on my high horse, I tend to sound like I'm addressing a political meeting. (laughs) You need to understand one thing above all about Spain. This is the country where they invented surrealism and nothing is quite the way you think it is. Camaradas, ah. aquí os traigo el buen café de Barcelona. Ah, gracias. gracias. Os he traído también algo de pan. Yeah. Al pies grandes le vendrá bien comer un poco. <laughs> Está chupalillo. <laughs> what, 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 what did he say, pies grandes? Uh, he said you were too thin and have big feet. Ah, size 12s. I need to find some boots. Mm. <laughs> Oh, it's good coffee. Yeah. Mm. The last good coffee I had was made by a man who thought all political activity was pointless. Listen, Blair. Mm. The Spanish left grew out of this country of Catalonia. Mm. Here is where 90% of Spain's industry is built, and it was out of those factories and workshops that the anarchists led the struggle for workers' freedom and land for the landless peasants. They were the first to throw themselves against the fascists, the first to die. Organised anarchy, it sounds... Surreal? (laughs) Only in Spain, and it isn't that organised. But the Spanish left is bigger than just the anarchists. Yes, it's a loose gaggle of left, socialist and communist parties which have formed themselves into one grouping, Poom. The Workers' Party of Marxist Unification. It's Poom who are linked to the Independent Labour Party in England, and that is why I'm here instead of with the international brigades in Madrid. That, and the fact that Harry Pollitt didn't trust you, he'll trust you even less now. I'm part of the fight, aren't I? The Communist Party of Great Britain follows the general line of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And if there's anything the Russians hate more than a fascist, it's a Trotskyist. And Poom and the anarchists are, as the comrade waiter pointed out, 
the nearest thing to Trotsky, this side of his Paris flat. Well, that doesn't really bother me, McNair. What I care about is being part of the struggle. But you are not part of the struggle. You are part of the press, writing articles for the ILP magazine. Well, I still need a good pair of boots if I'm going to the front line. They don't like journalists at the front. They get in the way. I wasn't thinking of writing. What I had in mind was more in the way of killing fascists. Did you, by God? Ever fired a gun? I fired a lot of them. Officer training in the corps at Eton? The bullet doesn't discriminate. Ever kill a man? Uh, no, but I've seen a man die by violence. Are you ready for this? I've been getting ready my whole life long. Then you better get used to these. Hmm? Spanish fags. That's oh. what they issue, the volunteers. <laughs> oh. Good black Spanish tobacco. Oh, thank you. Ah. Uh. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, it's good stuff, if, uh, if somewhat strong. Then welcome to Barcelona and the revolution, comrade. I suppose he grew on me. There was also a letter from Fenner Brockwaite waiting at the ILP office, which explained that Mr Blair was actually George Orwell, the writer, not just a journalist looking for a war story. I, I thought he was well-meaning, but naive. But then, to an extent, most of us were. M McNair took me to the Lenin barracks, where I saw the young militiaman I talked about earlier. I signed on and joined the other recruits who were undergoing training of a sort... of a sort that I had never, never experienced before. The whole place was in a state of... in the condition of anarchy. We had uniforms of a sort, though what sort I can't to this day really say. Blue trousers, mine were, and too short. <laughs> My one pair of size 12 boots, a shirt I'd brought from England, Henry Miller's jacket. We were given instruction in uh, nothing very much. I remember an officer being furious because somebody asked for an order. There are no orders amongst comrades, comrade. And if a request was made and a comrade didn't agree, he said so, and a long political discussion would follow while the rest of us wandered off to play football. As for weapons that worked, uh, that were less than 50 years old or that were not corroded or rusted, no sign. Uh, there were rumours that the international brigades equipped by Russia had all the latest equipment. I couldn't say at that time. But what I remember is the spirit of those boys. And boys they mostly were. That was something to see. Young men and women realising for the first time that things could be changed for the better. For them. By them. Spain. A nation in turmoil, brother against brother, father against son, in the grip of civil war. In Barcelona, the young recruits of the Lenin Brigade march out for the front, where they will defend the Republic against her enemies. In Madrid, the international brigades resist the siege imposed by nationalist leader General Franco. In London, Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax speaks. The International Non-Intervention Committee has determined to the best of its ability that no foreign powers are now or intending in the future any interference in the Spanish War. Lord Halifax is flying to Germany to discuss the international situation with Herr Hitler and Signor Mussolini. In the skies of Spain, the crack pilots of Germany's Condor Legion fly their missions of support and supply. Hello? Hello, I, I was asked to report here to the, to the Commissar. Ah, I am the man, comrade. Uh, and you are the famous writer Eric Blair. Uh, George Orwell, actually. Comrade, that, that's the name I use and, and not famous. Comrade, welcome. I am George Kopp. Uh, you have come from Barcelona? Oh, of course you have, with the volunteers. Yes, comrade. The training is good, huh? Good 
anarchist training? Yes, yes, it was. Um, no, it was very, uh, very interesting. There were a uh, lot of political discussions, uh, some proposals, <laughs> uh, a few games of football. Actually, we, we played a lot of football uh, anarchically, uh, but not a lot of training. No, uh, but a lot of revolutionary spirit. Yes. Oh, yes. Good. The training we can supply. I was in the Belgian army. It was my speciality. Come, come. I will. Uh, I'll show you the front line. The popular front line. <laughs> has, there, has there been much fighting up here? So far, not so much, but it will come. Hopefully better equipment will come before then. Uh, the stuff we've been issued with is hopeless. Spirit, heart, revolutionary zeal is what we have, Comrade Blair. What the French call élan. What we Belgians call stupidity. <laughs> yes, I, I am Belgian. In the army during the war, decorated in a fight to preserve a corrupt system, but I have seen a better way. Here we remake the world together. Damn. Are you all right, comrade? You know, I, I'm, I'm fine. I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't duck at my first bullet. Duck? Uh, his hide. Flinch, flinch. Ah, everybody ducks. It can't be helped. It is uh, human nature. Uh, but we socialists, huh? We will change that. Well, I mean, most of the comrades here don't seem to take cover at all. Ah, the young comrades defy the bullets of the fascists. They laugh in the face of danger. And they get shot. Which is a waste of material, as no doubt Vladimir Ilyich would have said. <laughs> don't be a fool for bravery, comrade. Our job is to win the war, not to die trying. And, of course, you might just as easily duck into a bullet as away from one. Really? Does that happen a lot? Comrade, always shot bursts. Why waste valuable bullets on fascist bastards when one or two will do the job? <laughs> Comrade Blair, I know you understand something of training men. I need that. Hmm? You must help. I will promote you to corporal, kebble, as soon as I am able. And you will teach them what you know. British Army, yes? It, it, it's sometimes hard, I think, to get anarchists to listen. Uh, what do they say? Um, the first order is that there shall be no more orders. But we communists teach by example. Yes. What do they want to do? Kill fascists. Let us kill fascists together. You and I, Comrade Eric. Uh, and now I must leave you, but we will meet again. I know this. Can you see the future, comrade? Didn't you know? We communists make the future. Huh? <laughs> uh, be careful. What do you mean? What you say. Who you say it to. Out here in Catalonia, we are a long way from Barcelona. Even further from Moscow. But things get heard and remembered. Not everything is as it appears. And Sarmos, camarada! Marta los fascistas! Kill fascists! I wanted to do something for the cause. And I wanted to be near Eric. I went to Spain. As simple as that. Though, of course, it, it wasn't that simple. I left my aunt in charge of the shop. I took with me some of the things Eric had written that he missed. Typhoo tea, chocolates, his favourite tobacco. Apparently the, the black Spanish stuff was bad for his throat. I had a letter from Fenner Brockway stating that I was to work in the Independent Labour Party office in Barcelona in a secretarial capacity. That meant getting letters and supplies to the ILP men at the front and making sure their letters were sent on home with the least possible delay. I was to report to John McNair. Uh, I opened the door and there was this girl. Short, round-faced, rather uh, fresh-looking, actually rather pleasant and, <laughs> and obviously not Spanish. I said, can I help you, miss? And she said, no. Uh, I've come to help you. <laughs> she had this, this huge case. Goodness knows how she'd managed it. I think it was bigger than she was. She announced, <clears throat> I am Eileen Blair, and proceeded to do exactly what she said she would, organise the whole kit and caboodle. She, she was good, too. 
And, uh, well, I have to say, I thought better of Blair just because she obviously loved him and thought the world of him. She was a breath of fresh air. But she didn't know, neither of them did, the threat that was ready to cut them off, cut them down. I think she had an inkling of the issues. Yes, she was, she was shrewd. She could see things. After working in the ILP office for a while, I, I got the idea I'd like to go to the front to see Eric, just to see what it was like. I, I don't intend that to sound like war tourism. It, it wasn't, but I missed him. I wanted to be with him, if only for a night. John McNair told me to see Eric's commanding officer, George Cobb. Not that there were any officers as such in a revolutionary army. <laughs> she was a, a very lively young woman. I took to her at once. I took her to dinner. You could still get a, a good dinner in Barcelona at that time. She wanted to go to the front. Well, who am I to refuse the wishes of a, a lovely woman? That winter in Zaragoza was unmitigated misery. I, um, I can remember cold, intense cold, hunger, everything getting wet and never drying, the smell of, uh, of, of wet cloth and 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 the uh, the boredom and no action we sat there cold and 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 waiting and waiting for something to happen by march it was snowing we were all getting intensely frustrated but then one day yes i did finally get an enemy in the sights of my gun easy Easy. Don't, don't scare Shh, him. I've got him. I've got him. Steady. I've got Come him. right tight, you time. Steady. I'm shivering too much. I can't sight the bloody rifle. Wait a minute. Hurry. All right, all right, all right. Wait, wait, wait. Shh, 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 shh. Pray to marks. This one's not a dud. Oh, wait, wait, wait. He's moving. Shh. Uh, I was all right. Who's there? Go on, comrade. Take the shot. Got him. I hate the little buggers. One of them was eating my boots the other day, and I have no spare boots. Only they're not uh, they're not little buggers, are they? These these buggers, they're big as cats. Rats as rats as big as big cats. <laughs> Bloody hell! Your shot did that. Run! What'd you do that for? Bloody idiot, I was eating my bloody breakfast. Save your bullets for the fascist, not the rats. We cannot eat rats. Come here. Bloody idiots. Come on, comrade, nobody likes rats except rats. <laughs> nobody likes Tories except Tories. We don't go around shooting them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <clears throat> here comes the brass. There's no brass now, comrade. Yeah, try to tell them that in Barcelona. Oh, more bloody. Holy mother of marks, it's a woman. Pinch me, comrade. I've forgotten what they look like. Hello, Eric. Comrade Cop offered to give me a lift from Barcelona. Comrades, greetings. We have supplies and letters from home. Yay! Yay! Bloody socialist tough. He even gets the girl. Hello, comrade. It's a privilege to meet you. Oh, you too, comrade. It's a tonic, so it is. <laughs> comrade Blair, who ever thought that rangy bugger had such a lovely lady? <laughs> Comrade, girl. There are letters for everyone in the car. I made sure we got everything that was in the office. And there's tea and English cigarettes. Oh, bless you for that, comrade. No word for your comrade wife, Eric. God, it's good to see you. God, you need a bath. <laughs> Is it always this cold? No, uh, no, it's usually worse. Never mind. I needed to see you, my love, and here you are. 
Mm. Is it really as boring as your letters make it out? I shot a rat. Oh. Yes, it's, it's the most warlike thing I've done since I got here. Comrade Cobb says there's going to be a movement across the whole Zaragoza front once the weather improves. I hope so. Right now the war's a pantomime and we're the clowns. But you can't say there won't be any risk. Uh, no, no, I can't say that. I went to the hospital, the, the first aid station, whatever they call it, on the way. Oh, yes, I know. I, I, I saw the doctor there. He told me I was lacking food, lacking sleep. Did you see his hands? Hmm? Oh, did, did you see the place itself? Don't get wounded, Eric, and if you do, don't get sent to his hospital. Well, I shouldn't think it'll be up to me if it happens. And don't worry, I'll, I'll keep my head down. I do worry. Your head has so much further to go down than anyone else's. True. And really, darling, I, I don't think any of this is terribly well organised. As soon as I get leave, I'll come to Barcelona and transfer to the International Brigade. They know what they're doing. Well, comrade Cobb doesn't seem to trust them. Yes, well, I like Cobb, but somehow I'm not sure I quite trust him. He's very charming. Well, there you are. I can take care of myself. Don't worry. Yes, but that's wrong, isn't it? I mean, we do worry, and we should worry about each other. Yes. Yes, we should. Comrade Blair, I've been reading your book. It's a good book. It reminded me of my own days in the coal fields of Belgium. But never mind that. I know you would value some time with your charming comrade wife, so please, you have my permission to leave the line. Oh, okay. uh, there is a, a farmhouse a few miles back, comrade Eileen. I would collect you there at three o'clock tomorrow morning. But, but I thought you had to return tonight. In war, nothing is certain. And for love, there is always time. Comrade Blair, I think I can promise you action soon. Ben Seremos. He didn't have to do that. My opinion of Comrade Cop has just improved somewhat. You see, Eric, <laughs> they want to keep you. What? I was talking to McNair and he, he let it out by mistake, well, I think. Maybe he intended me to know. But they don't want you to join the international brigades. You, you're a name for them. George Orwell is fighting in Spain under the independent Labour Party banner. McNair said the only reason all of you ILP volunteers are posted to the same unit is to make it look better for Fenner Brockway and the party. I think there's a lot more going on here than... And they want us to know. No, but surely we've got away from all that. It's still politics, even if it's war. Yes, but for tonight, it's you and me. And there had better be a bath at that farmhouse. <laughs> if not, mister, it's the horse trough for you. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed being at the front. Bob Edwards, who was the commander of the ILP contingent, was away, so Eric was actually in charge. But there was nothing to do except sentry duty on freezing night. Being the cabo didn't get me off that. After all, we were comrades. <coughs> Who goes there? Your relief. Oh. <coughs> At this time of night, it'd have to be that. Or a fool. Afe. <laughs> On frio, de cojones. What? What's brass monkey in Spanish? <coughs> yeah, they say the fascists don't even like night attacks. <laughs> They're fascists. They obey orders. It's your fact. Thank you. <coughs> I bet V.R. Lenin never had to stand guard at two in the morning freezing his ass. Shall we wake them up over there? If we're missing our sleep, why shouldn't they miss theirs? All this. Don't waste ammo. Aren't we supposed to be anarchists? I don't know what we're supposed to be. Popular front, United front, Comintern, Trotskyist, Poom, Seventh International, anarcho syndicalist. <laughs> don't ask me, comrade. We could sing. <coughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, we could sing the Eaton Boating song. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's actually, um... I like it. Uh, I don't really know the words. You sing it. 
jolly boating weather and a hay harvest breeze blade on the feather <laughs> shade of the trees swing swing together with your bodies between your knees and nothing shall sever the chain that is round What the devil is that, Captain? That sergeant is the English communists. They're all mad. Quite mad, the English. It is a well-known fact. In Homage to Catalonia, Eric Blair was played by Joseph Milson, Eileen Blair by Lindsay Marshall, George Cop by Ewan Bailey, John McNair by John McAndrew, Henry Miller by Richard Lang, Tom Gallagher by Gareth Pierce, The Spanish Volunteer by Javier Mazin, Jack by Howell John, Benjamin by John Lollis, Idris by Ben McGregor, and The Militiaman by A.C. Newman. Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell was adapted by Mike Walker. It was a BBC Cymru Wales production, directed by Kate McCall. <laughs>